Next is committee substitute for committee substitute House Bill 163, Representative Gates. Dealing with weapons and firearms, Representative Gates, you're recognized to explain your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I cannot help but notice this is quite the powerhouse committee as far as the talent of your membership. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, I'd like to explain the strike all amendment. And there is a strike all amendment by Representative Gates, and you're recognized to explain the strike all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This strike all amendment is the consequence of negotiations I have had with the Florida Police Chiefs Association regarding the open carry legislation that I've brought forward. The strike all allows for open carry in a circumstance where a Floridian has a legal permit. Uh, right now we have a concealed permit process. We do not alter that process in the strike all. This allows for the open carry of handguns only. It protects private property rights and makes very clear that nothing in the bill or in the laws of our state impair the rights of a private property owner to be able to uh, dictate the conduct that they would have on their own property and the strike all amendment. Uh, thank you, Representative Plakin, for working with me uh, on uh, some language in the strike all that has a holstering requirement uh, for uh, the open carry provisions that we allow. That's the strike all amendment, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Members, uh, please note there are, are two amendments and a substitute amendment as well. Do members have any questions, uh, however, on the strike all amendment? Any questions on this? Representative Gonzalez, you're recognized for a question on the strike call. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chair Gates, um, regarding your private property uh, provision, uh, which I think is a very uh, helpful one, how does this interplay with um, facilities such as hospitals? Are they included in the private property uh, provisions? Uh, carte blanche or are some hospitals, would some hospitals be considered private properties and others not? You're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Only private hospitals would enjoy these private property rights. Public hospitals that are funded by the taxpayer uh, would be considered public property and would not have the ability to impair someone's right to openly carry under the strike call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any additional questions on the strike call? Representative Ray Winkle Vassalunda, you're recognized for a question. Thank you. Um, Chair Gates, does, can you explain the holstering provision and whether that applies to, for instance, if I had my um, concealed weapon in my purse uh, and inadvertently showed it? Uh, could you? Yes, you're thank recognized to respond. I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Representative Ray Winkle Vasilinda, if you look at line 71 to 73 of the strike all, uh, there we have the holstering requirement articulated, but also we have said that one would satisfy the holstering requirement if they had their firearm in a case or in a bag. Uh, because of the reason you just described, several of my female constituents gave me input that they may be taking their pocketbook out of their purse. A firearm might be inadvertently displayed, and they wouldn't want to see uh, an arrest be the consequence of that circumstance. Any additional questions? Representative Wood, you're recognized for a question on the strike call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I want to follow up on the, the, the holstering clarification that you've added to, the, um, to your strike hole amendment. Would, would that apply, the holstering re, uh, requirement apply to a citizen that is carrying concealed? You're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no, Representative Wood, if you look on line 69, uh, we state that this provision applies to a firearm that is openly carried under the section. Thank you very much. Representative Dudley, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Gates, with regard to hospitals, you talked, uh, you made a distinction between private and public hospitals. So presumably if a private hospital wants to preclude the carrying of concealed or open carry weapons, they can, they can stop that. But presumably, with public hospitals, that wouldn't the they wouldn't have the right to uh, stop that the open carrying of weapons. Representative Gates, you're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is correct. Follow up, Representative Dudley. Thank you. Why would we want people carrying weapons open in a, in public hospitals or any hospitals? You're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well. There is absolutely no evidence that I have seen from anywhere that indicates that open carry at a hospital impairs anyone's public safety. And for that matter, there's no evidence that suggests that open carry anywhere impairs public safety. Forty-five states in this country have open carry laws. The crime rate 
for violent crime is 23% lower in the states that allow open carry than in the states that don't allow open carry. And the sample size is pretty big. There's over 100 million Americans that live in both states with uh, open carry and that, that don't permit open carry. Any, Representative Rodriguez, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wanted to go back to the hypothetical that uh, Representative Rewinkle Vesselinda asked you to kind of understand how that wouldn't be covered by existing law. So that if a permit holder was carrying uh, a firearm legally in a purse, a place where they could carry a firearm, and accidentally showed it under current law, um, it was not in a rude, careless, angry, or threatening manner. It was just very brief, literally just an accident. How would that not be covered by current law? How would that person be violating current law? How would they be subject to uh, uh, criminal statutes? You're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, actually, they shouldn't be, Representative Rodriguez. So my response to Representative Bray Winkle Vasilinas' question spoke to, uh, I, I believe, ensuring that the strike all didn't constrain those rights that exist under current law. But I, I apologize if my representation indicated that under current law that that would be unlawful. Representative Moskowitz, you're recognized for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Gates, in Texas, when they passed this law, uh, there was some vagueness as to uh, the the weapon that could be openly carried, and as it turned out, it wasn't just handguns. It wound up to be rifles and assault weapons, and people were openly carrying those. Do, do you feel that your legislation has 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 made sure that that we don't have that issue in Texas, or maybe the, you don't think that's an issue? I'm I'm just wondering. I want to make sure that we haven't because the, the intent in Texas was for that not to happen, and then that became an issue. Representative Gates, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize, Representative Moskowitz. I have not closely followed that issue in Texas. I can tell you that our bill is very clear on that subject. One can only get a CCW for a handgun, and one can only openly carry if they have a CCW. Representative Edwards, you recognize for a question. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Representative Gates, I wanted to go back to the 2011 law and what we've seen transpire since then and the need for you bringing us this bill today. Can you give me some examples of the various abuses for those individuals who inadvertently perhaps um, openly displayed their firearm and then were subsequently charged and prosecuted? Can you explain on those abuses, please? You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will uh, give you a less uh, robust description than those who are practitioners in this space who can walk you through specific cases. I'm aware of one circumstance where someone had a firearm and their shirt was tucked into the back of their holster inadvertently for a long period of time, not briefly, but they just didn't know it, and then that resulted in an arrest. But I wouldn't want to leave you, Representative Edwards, or any other member of the committee with the impression that I'm doing this bill just to solve the problem of inadvertent display. I truly want to vindicate the right of, uh, to openly carry. This is not just a fix for an inadvertent display. I, I have broader goals. Additional questions on the strike all. Seeing no questions on the strike all, uh, we do have some public testimony uh, just on the strike all. Tim Stanfield, Florida Police Chiefs Association. Waves in support. Uh, I have some questions of Nick. the Police Chiefs Association, Mr. Chair. Okay. You want to come up? Uh, Representative Kerner, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Stanfield, I'm wondering, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the process that the Florida Chiefs of Police Association took in endorsing these amendments and this bill overall? Uh, Mr. Stanfield, you're recognized. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Representative Kerner. Um, so when the bill was filed, uh, like all other bills that kind of touched the criminal justice area, the language that was sent out to the Police Chiefs Association um, and then brought to the Police Chiefs Association Legislative Committee, um, the committee identified issues with the bill, um, four distinct issues. Um, we then met with the sponsors of the bill going forward and they asked for language to address the problems. We drafted language and through a great bit of deliberation, many, many uh, meetings by conference call, the Chief's Legislative Committee decided that in exchange for the amendments that you're seeing today, they would support this bill. Uh, follow up, Ranking Chair. Member Kerner, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And who were... 
May I clarify a couple Please. of points? I'm sorry, My name is Amy Mercer. I'm the Executive Director for Florida Police Chiefs Association. Ms. Uh, Mercer, yes. uh, we need you to fill out an appearance card. Absolutely. All right, you you're go? recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to clarify that it wasn't only our legislative committee that made the recommendation. This was put before our full board of directors. As with any other issue that comes before the Florida Police Chiefs Association, we were requiring on our leadership to make a vote, and that was done. We have 17 district directors that represent every region of the state, and we have nine executive board members, including myself. All right. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Follow up, ranking member. It, and is it the overall um, decision of your board and the members that sit on that board that they endorse the policy of open carry? You're recognized to respond. Thank you. We endorse the amendments that we've put forth. Mr. Chair. I, Another follow up, well, ranking yeah, member. I you're recognized. Ask, I need to ask the same question, Mr. Chair. I, well, I think she answered the question. Do you have another question, right there, member? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. You're recognized. Specifically to the concept of open carry and publicly carrying that firearm on your hip or in public by a private citizen, do the Chiefs of Police Association endorse that policy, not the amendments? Our, recognized to respond. I'm sorry, Let's go Mr. through the chair. chair. Yes, I'm okay. sorry. Thank you. Um, our particular board vote was not specific to that. What our specific um, vote pertained to was the amendments that we worked on with the bill sponsors, and the vote was made then to support the bill if amended with our amendments. Thank you. And last question, Mr. Chair. If I last question, Thank Ranking you. Member. Um, You're recognized. On behalf of the Chiefs of Police Association, is it your opinion, um, well, maybe you can explain to me why there was such controversy surrounding the endorsement of this, these amendments and possibly the bill as an overall policy uh, amongst the members of your organization. Uh, You're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not aware of huge controversy from within our association on the issue. I think there's a lot of uh, controversy on the issue as a whole throughout the state, but anything particular to our association, I'm not aware of. Okay. Uh, next is Nick, Nick Finch. Wave in support of the strike call. Uh, again, this is just the strike call. Uh, Gordon Smith. I wave in support of the strike call amendment. Next on the strike call, Wayne Ivey. Chair for Bavard County, I wave in support of the strike call to preserve the right to speak on other amendments. Right. Waves in support. Next is Clarence Morrison. Waves in support. Next is Marion Hammer, NRA and United Sportsmen of Florida. Ms. Hammer, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, we were pleased to be involved with the Florida Police Chiefs and the bill sponsors uh, in crafting what eventually became this uh, strike all. We believe the amendments that the police chiefs asked for were reasonable. Uh, and we support them, and we wholeheartedly support the strike all. Thank you. Question? Uh, Ms. Hammer, there's a question. Representative Moskowitz, you're recognized for a question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, is there anything in the strike all that would prevent a non-U.S. citizen from getting a concealed weapons permit and being allowed to openly carry. Ms. Hammer, you're recognized. I'm not aware of anything in the strike all that applies to non-U.S. citizens. If a non-U.S. citizen can get a license to carry concealed, they will also be able to carry openly. Follow up? Oh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Is there anything in the strike all that would prevent somebody on the no-fly list from getting a concealed weapons permit or an open uh, to allow openly carry. Ms. Hammer, you're recognized. 
I'm not aware of anything in most of Florida law that addresses the no-fly list, but as a rule, the no-fly list is very flawed, and I would not wish to see uh, that become a part of of any legislation that impacts constitutional rights. All right. Thank you, Ms. Hammer. Thank you. Next is Lisa Henning, Fraternal Order of Police. We're on the strike all. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Fair enough. Next is Tim Stanfield for Police Chiefs Associate. Well, that's a, they already had that. Okay, hopefully this is a new one. Craig Kahn, Florida League of Cities. Chairman, I'd mark for the Kerner Amendment on my form. I sure did. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. All right. Um, Eric Friday on the substitute amendment. Oh, excuse me, the strike all. On the strike all. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm here on behalf of Florida Carry, and it's 37,000 members and supporters. We appreciate the police chiefs coming and working with us and the NRA to develop a plan that supports the rights of Floridians while making sure that law enforcement has the ability to do what it needs to do to ensure the safety of our citizens. But the police chiefs have done what the sheriffs have refused to do. The police chiefs have actually looked at the 45 other states. They've seen what's worked there. They're, letting it, they're wanting it to work here, and we support the amendment. All right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, next one is Ryan Ramsey on the strike call. I'm in support of the strike call, but I, I want to speak later. Strike call. Okay, no, no additional public testimony on the strike call. We need to move this, uh, put this bill in the pr uh, proper posture. So the first will be a amendment to the amendment by Representative Wood. Representative Wood, you are recognized to explain the First Amendment to Amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, the uh, First Amendment to Amendment, as you can see, uh, deletes uh, the uh, first, in Section 1, deletes the uh, uh, lines, um, uh, lines 8 through 19. Uh, and the primary focus of, and then reinserts uh, the provision on uh, nothing in the chapter intent, is intended to restrict law enforcement. I think the, um, the strike all um, attempted to address this issue, but I feel that the, the, uh, the basis for this amendment is that we're getting the, uh, uh, the cart before the horse. We're in this uh, strike all amendment uh, adopting new policies uh, in this area of the law, and at the same time putting penalties on the people that are going to be enforcing those laws for the first time. I think before this legislature puts penalties on uh, anyone, we need a clear record that the law is not being followed properly. And so for that reason, um, I've uh, requested uh, that this amendment be inserted so that uh, we can let uh, the law enforcement community um, go forward with enforcing this law if uh, and I'm a big supporter of this amendment and if, if it becomes clear that um, the uh, the law is not being um, enforced properly and and we have a clear record then we can come back and consider this provision at a future legislature thank you that is the amendment mr. Uh, mr. chair all right, are there any questions on the uh, amendment, the First Amendment to the strike call? Uh, Representative, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to know from the sponsor of the strike call amendment and the bill whether this is a friendly amendment. Representative Gates, you're recognized. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative Harrell. This is not a friendly amendment. What Representative Wood's amendment does is it removes the consequences for people who break the law. And in any law that we pass, if you don't have consequences when people break the law, then you have an infirm law. So uh, I have worked very closely with the Police Chiefs Association on language that ensures that at no point do we ever impair a law enforcement officer's ability to do their job and conduct their investigations. But I don't think that that means that in any circumstance where the law is broken, there shouldn't be a consequence, and that would be the result if the Wood Amendment was adopted. Any additional questions on it? Representative Moskowitz, you're recognized for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and this is either for Representative Wood or, or, or the sponsor. Is there anything either in the amendment or the strike all that if a police officer asks someone uh, to show identification that they have a concealed weapons permit and that person refuses to show that they have the permit uh, or they have a license to open carry and they refuse to show it, okay, uh, is there, what is the police officer's ability then to, to take any action. Uh, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, is there anything to strike all in the amendment that would address that? Representative Wood, you're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that is a very good question, Representative Moxworth, because I don't know the answer to that. And that's exactly why I think that we need to take this out. We need to let this law be uh, implemented. We ne need to let these situations arise and uh, a, a record uh, be determined about how this law is applied in our great state. And uh, like I said, I support this great policy uh, shift that uh, Representative Gates is bringing to us. I just don't support penalizing uh, uh, because there's, as Representative Marcus West has just pointed out with his question, there's all these unknowns that, that, that need to be clarified going forward. Here. Representative Gonzalez, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Wood, um, I'm reading your amendment and uh, if the amendment were to, amendment to the amendment were to pass, then the law would read, nothing in this chapter is instend, intended to restrict the law enforcement officer's ability to authorize or conduct investigations as otherwise authorized by law. How is this in any way anything other than a restatement, a superfluous restatement of what is an accepted concept in statutory law? Representative Wood, you're recognized to respond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Representative Gonzalez. I think you're you've, you've made a, que a question that uh, perhaps is is valid. But on the other hand, the strike all does say uh, and and makes clear that the legislature's intent is not to restrict a law enforcement officer's ability or authority to conduct investigations otherwise authorized by law. I don't have a problem with that language, and that's why I, I, I wanted it to remain uh, in, in the law so that it's clear that we support law enforcement. We support public safety. This bill, this good bill, is intended to enhance public safety, and I, I certainly want to make that clear, and I would not want to take the language out and make it unclear that this legislature does not support our law enforcement and public safety. Any additional questions of the amendment to amendment sponsor? Okay. Representative Moskowitz, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this, I'll ask this of the, of the sponsor. If this amendment is unfriendly because of just how it's drafted, uh, how do you think the issue should be solved, or maybe you don't think it's an issue, if someone is, if a police officer asks someone for identification and that person refuses to present the identification, how do you think that situation should be addressed, or maybe you think it shouldn't be addressed? I just would like to hear the sponsor's take on that. Representative Gates, you're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, as an attorney, Representative Moskowitz, you know well that we have a standard for probable cause for any circumstance where reasonable suspicion would arise. So I don't intend to go and change the reasonable suspicion standard, the probable cause standard. I think that those have worked well. I don't think that a gun owner or someone exercising their Second Amendment rights should be any more or any less harassed than any other citizen uh, who is not committing any crime or raising any other reasonable suspicion. Follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with you. So let's say that there is that probable cause and then the police officer asks for identification and the identification is refused to be provided. 
what then steps can that police officer take without Representative Wood's amendment? You're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, if there's probable cause, the person could be arrested. Uh, and that's why we, we worked with the police chiefs to craft this language that says that, I mean, if there's probable cause or even reasonable suspicion, which is a lower standard than probable cause, nothing that we put in this law can impair or should impair the ability of a law enforcement officer to conduct that investigation. And I would assume if there is reasonable suspicion or probable cause, that of course part of that investigation is determining whether or not someone has the lawful permit. Well, last follow-up, Mr. Chairman. another follow-up. Yes, okay. last, recognized. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, fair enough. But without Representative Wood's amendment, do you not believe police officers are who might believe that there is reasonable suspicion or probable cause, might be hesitant <clears throat> to then follow up on it because of the penalties, that if they were wrong or if they're proven wrong at a later step in time, that they then can have actions taken against them. So don't you believe without, whether it's this language or some other language, that we are actually disincentivizing police officers to do their job? Representative Gates, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm afraid there's little more I can add, Representative Moskowitz. The language that is in both the strike all and the amendment to the amendment says that nothing is intended to restrict a law enforcement officer's ability or authority to conduct investigations as otherwise authorized by the law. That's as clear and succinct as I believe I can be. I can't speak to someone's reticence, but all we can do is put into the law very clearly that we don't intend to impair a law enforcement officer's ability to conduct an investigation if there is reasonable suspicion, if there is probable cause. Okay. Any additional questions on the amendment to the amendment? Representative Dudley, you recognize for a question on the amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Gates, there's some uh, quote about uh, good intentions and the road uh, regarding that. Uh, Practically speaking, don't the penalties in this chill law enforcement's desire and interest to investigate if they're looking at being sued in the way that is included in this bill? Correct amendment. To respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I, I have little new to offer and in response to the same question, which is when we specifically th say they're allowed to investigate, I don't think that should chill their ability to then go and investigate. <laughs> Any additional questions on the amendment to the amendment? Okay, we have some appearance yeah. cards. Representative Dudley, you have a question? Okay. What other example, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. What other example in law is there uh, where law enforcement is going to be sued uh, in the situation where they're engaged in uh, determining, and, and you understand that an investigatory stop is different than probable cause, right? You're, you're recognized. So, so what other example in law is there where law enforcement faces being sued uh, in these circum type circumstances? You're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would say the most frequent circumstance in which that arises is in federal Section 1983 cases for civil rights violations. That is a circumstance where an individual law enforcement officer or agent of the government can be individually named in a lawsuit in a Section 1983 action. All right. Uh, we do have some appearance cards on the amendment to the amendment. Uh, Marion Hammer. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Existing law for a license holder requires that you show your permit when asked by a law enforcement officer. Requires. So to refuse is probable cause to suspect that you have no license. So the law mandates showing that license. Time and time again, we've seen where you pass a law, you put no penalties, 
There's no incentive to follow the law if you don't like it. We had a situation where we passed a law with preemption. It didn't put penalties. We assumed local governments would follow the law. They didn't. Their attorney said there are no penalties, so do what you want to do. Make them sue you. So we went back and added penalties, and that brought it to a halt. Every single person is responsible for following the law, and there is nothing like penalties to make people be familiar with the law and to make them follow it. We oppose this amendment. Thank you. Next is Gordon Smith. I definitely waive in opposition to this amendment. Thank you, sir. Wave in opposition. Next is Nick Finch. Wave in opposition. Waves in opposition. Next is Wayne Ivey. Sheriff of Brevard County, I wave in opposition. Waves in opposition. Next is Clarence Morrison. Next is Ryan Ramsey. I wave in opposition. I'll just speak up. Waves in opposition. Next is Eric Friday. Mr. Friday, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We've experienced problems with the open carry statute before 2011. In 2011, we amended it. We've experienced problems since 2011. An amendment today that does not include penalties will continue to cause problems. Joel Smith of Citrus County, or excuse me, of Polk County was threatened to be shot in the back when his gun became exposed during a traffic stop. In Tampa, a gentleman who was merely fishing on a pier was detained for over an hour while his phone, his vehicle were searched, his contacts on his phone were gone through. In Volusia County, a gentleman riding his bicycle to go fishing was stopped and detained and an internal affairs report actually found that the officer had behaved unprofessionally. We have a problem, members, with misbehavior of some of our citizens by certain individuals. If you don't break the law, you don't have anything to worry about with this bill as it's written, and there's no need to have an amendment that allows people to break the law just because they don't know it or don't want to follow a law that has no penalties. Florida Kerry opposes this bill and we'd ask you, or, excuse me, opposes this amendment and we ask you to vote in opposition. Thank you. Next is St Tim Stanfield, Florida Police Chiefs Association. On the bill, we may be supporting the bill. Okay, we're on the amendment to the amendment. Okay. Neither way. Craig Kahn, Florida League of Cities. Mr. Kahn, you're recognized. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Craig Kahn with the Florida League of Cities. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I apologize. I just checked online for uh, Representative Wood's amendment. It is not yet posted. Uh, as I understand the amendment, it uh, attempts to remove lines, uh, at least including 8 through 15 of the, uh, of the amendment. And um, that is exactly the concern that the League wants to raise today. Um, let me start by saying that uh, uh, we do work hand in hand with the Florida Police Chiefs Association and we frequently defer uh, to the police on purely law enforcement matters. However, uh, uh, the language at lines 8 through 15 um, speaks about the creating of certain rights, the uh, uh, liabilities associated with any infringement on those rights, the waiver of sovereign immunity and all other immunities associated with any liability that may be associated with the infringement on those rights. Those are not necessarily law enforcement matters because this language applies to persons or entities, which means it picks up all of the employers of all of these uh, uh, individuals, be it a, uh, a police department or a city that uh, 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 hires law enforcement officers, be it a sheriff's office or the county that is responsible for funding that sheriff's office, be it a state university that has its own police force, or be it a state agency such as the um, uh, FDLE or the Highway Safety with the Troopers. So, 
Uh, in, in, in a letter dated March 7th of this year, uh, I, I, I expressed our concerns to Representative Gates, uh, and we're not necessarily opposed to a penalty relating to open carry. However, this language creates an entire new section of law, and it is extraordinarily broad in its application. We are concerned. Uh, uh, that is our primary concern. Um, if, the, if the intent is to have penalties associated with the infringement on the ability to open carry, a much more narrow uh, penalty provision can be drafted specifically to Section 790.053, which is the open carry section of the statutes. I want to bring to your attention some provisions in this language that Representative Wood and his amendment is, a, is, attempt, is attempting to extract from the bill. This language says that Section 790.33, which is all the penalty provisions for the preemption that Ms. Hammer spoke of, applies to any person or entity. I already explained to you the entity aspect. All of us employers, all governmental entities, uh, uh, infringing upon the rights. Okay, rights is very critical in this analysis, conferred by this chapter, Chapter 790. Chapter 790 is 27 pages long and has 61 different sections of law in it. Chapter uh, 70, 766. Chapter 766 has 12 sections of law in it, and it goes on to state that any rights created by the federal or state constitution. Who knows the scope of what rights we're talking about in the first place? Then it goes on to say that there will be penalties associated for the infringement of any of those rights. Well, I presented Representative Gates a list of all the various sections of law that this could apply to, depending on how the word rights is defined. And once you determine what a right is, there's a waiver of immunity. The staff analysis at page, I believe, 12, goes into a great analysis as to the breadth of this waiver of all immunities, uh, including sovereign and otherwise. So. We are very concerned with this language in sections and uh, uh, in, 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 at lines 8 through 15. I understand the desire to, to continue to protect law enforcement officers individually at lines 16 through 18. Uh, 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 but the overriding concern is lines 8 through 15. We support Representative uh, Wood's amendment. Uh, uh, and that is the reason why we are supporting the Kerner Amendment, because it does not include this language. So with that, I'd be more than happy to try to answer any questions. All right, there are no more appearance cards, so at this time we'll go into debate. Is there debate on the amendment to amendment? All right, seeing no debate. Yes. Representative Dudley, you're recognized in debate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, this, you know, is a good amendment, and to not adopt it exposes uh, law enforcement to and our citizenry to unlimited uh, lawsuits, many tax dollars being diverted to, uh, you know, paying these suits. So, you know, we've talked about federal lawsuits. We're going to have a whole bunch of new state lawsuits, too. And uh, the last thing we want to do is to cow law enforcement into submission to not be able to enforce our laws. So I think this is a good amendment. We should vote for it. Thank you. Any additional debate on the amendment to amendment? Representative Ray Winkle Vassalunda, you're recognized in debate. I'm going to be voting for Representative Wood's amendment um, because I think that, as it's been explained, it looks like what uh, is in the strike call goes a step too far. Um, and I think that uh, we need to have moderation in this, and so I'm going to be um, voting for Representative Wood's amendment on that basis. Any additional debate on the amendment to the amendment? Representative Wood, you're recognized to close on the amendment to amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. and. Um, I was a little confused by some of the public testimony, and and I'm not sure uh, that the the sheriffs that were waving uh, in opposition to the amendment. I'm not sure if they are waving in opposition to my amendment or to 
the strike call amendment, but that's just my observation because there was, uh, I was, I was puzzled why the uh, sheriffs would be in opposition to this amendment, to the amend, to the amendment. But having said that, um, I think we've had a good debate on this, and uh, I think that it's uh, a question of the legislature um, changing policy, which I totally support this policy, but doing it in a way that is uh, rational. And then if, um, as, as, uh, as some of the testimony where we've, ha we've passed laws and then we find that they're not being enforced correctly, and we have a record of that, that we come back and make remedial legislation. Um, this is a whole new area of law. Uh, we're going to have to see how it plays out. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm just here to say that uh, my intent, intention on this amendment was is no one brought this to me, just a country lawyer reading the bill at night, and it just popped right out that, hey, we're, we're just going too far too quick. And it, um, it could well be that this language is necessary in the future. And I'm not going to be here, but I'm sure the folks that will will uh, look at it very carefully. So with that thought, legislature meets every year. I would respectfully request everyone, even though the, the bill sponsor is opposed to this, it does not gut the intent of his bill. It, it upholds his bill, and I plan to vote for his bill, but I can't vote for it if we keep this amendment in, because I just can't put that imposition on our good local government, our, 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 our good public safety uh, infrastructure, and um, it just, it's just creating too much too fast. So with that, I would appreciate your favorable support. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Wood, having closed on his amendment to amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed signify by saying nay. Nay. Nays have it. This time we'll go to the second amendment, amendment to amendment two. Uh, Representative Wood, you're recognized to explain the second amendment, amendment to amendment two. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, in looking at the uh, concealed um, weapons um, law, um, there are certain places where we don't want to have people having a, uh, a concealed weapon. And I know that we've had a bill that's argued about whether we should have them on university campuses. But it, it struck me that we allow in a courtroom the judge to carry a weapon, because he's the guy that people might get mad at. And he's there to execute his constitutional right to defend himself. Well, guess what? I feel like a target right now. We have security, but security is not always uh, fail safe. Um, <laughs> Representative Hunt said yes. And it might be some, some, some people that you wouldn't expect to be shooting at me. So um, this is, this is a, 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 to me, something that I think uh, makes sense. Some might call it self-serving. But at the same time, I think uh, the intent of this, of this legislation before us is a statement that pu public safety is enhanced by responsible citizens being allowed to carry a concealed weapon that are licensed. And I would like to extend that, uh, that public policy to members of the legislature in their official capacities. That is the amendment, Mr. Chairman. Are there any questions on the amendment to amendment two? All right, is there any public testimony on Representative Rodriguez, you're recognized for a question on amendment to amendment two. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> I just wonder if you could talk a bit more about uh, any special duties we would have. Um, I guess I'm sort of confused on you know, just, just, you know, again, because these are amendments filed that 
some of the members of the public who are here to comment may or may not have um, completely seen this, but what the amendment would do is that it would allow members of the legislature uh, to con carry concealed weapons, um, including firearms, um, as an exception to the prohibition generally on uh, concealed weapons in any meeting of the legislature or committee. And I wanted to know if you could talk in any detail about uh, special duties we may have or any reason why um, members of the legislature without any special training uh, or anything like that would, would uh, be in uh, either because of special duties or b special abilities that uh, I guess legislators presumably would have under the thinking with this amendment. Representative Wood, you're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative, I'm just applying the same standard to a member of the legislature in a official meeting that we apply to a judge in his courtroom where he is officially presiding. Same standard. Any other questions? Uh, at this point, I'm going to pass the gavel. I have a question. I'm going to pass that to Vice Chair Pasadoma. Representative Wood, it sounds like your amendment to amendment uh, may have some merit to it, but my concern is that it came up this morning, and we really haven't had an opportunity to, to vet this bill and the ramifications. Is this something you would consider bringing up at a later time? You're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Chairman, uh, that's, I, I respect your recommendation and I will uh, withdraw the amendment. Without the, without a, oh, get my gavel back. <laughs> without, without objection, show the uh, amendment withdrawn. Okay, at this time, there is a, another amendment to amendment that is handwritten that we have just received by Representative Moskowitz. And let's pass that out. And while it's being passed out, Representative Moskowitz, please explain your amendment to the strike all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The First, three, we'll call it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, let me apologize. I know you're feeling on, on handwritten amendments. Uh, but the reason I, I, I wrote this is I got the feeling that for many uh, on the committee, Representative Wood's amendment went too far. And so what I was trying to do is get to the crux of the issue here. So uh, as Ms. Hammer said, it is her interpretation that if a police officer asks you to present your license and you refuse, probable cause is established. That's what the amendment says. So now it's no longer, a pol if people are concerned about the chilling effect, I believe this solves it because now a police officer isn't going to have to worry if they ask and it's not given that they're going to have to defend whether or not they had probable cause to ask in the first place. Because if it's not presented, probable cause will have been established. That's all the amendment does. It's not a trick amendment. I'm not, it doesn't, I'm not trying to mess with the bill. It, it, it solves that area of ambiguity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there any questions on amendment to amendment three? Representative Harrell, you're recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to ask the sponsor of the uh, amendment to the amendment no, the sponsor of the original strike all amendment, if this is a friendly amendment to the amendment. Representative Gates, you're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I understand what Representative Moskowitz is attempting here. And actually, you know, whenever we can be expressly clear as opposed to simply referencing another statute, that seems like a viable thing to do. The only thing that concerns me about the amendment is that there's no, like, temporal relationship to time. So we wouldn't want to inadvertently, just because we're doing this in kind of a hasty fashion, have a situation where someone walks down the block in like every 10 steps, like they're having to pull out their wallet. So uh, I understand what you're trying to do, Representative Moskowitz. If, if you would give me the, the privilege of being able to work with you prior to this going to the floor, and if there's a way for us to work on some sort of a temporal time element, I just, you know, don't want this to be a license for harassment. And I know that's not your intent at all, um, but I would ask the committee to probably uh, demure on this amendment 
for at this point in time. Any additional questions on the amendment to amendment? Representative Gonzalez, you're recognized uh, for a question on amendment to amendment three. Representative Moskowitz, um, I thank you for your effort at trying to make a, um, a better bill, um, and it's an effort that I think most of us on the committee share. I, I think the problem with what we're trying to address that this does not address is the question of probable cause for the police officer to even ask the question about whether someone is having a, a permit. So my question to you is, um, am I am I wrong in in uh, concluding that although this does provide a protection to the um, to the um, individual who's carrying the weapon against wrongful prosecution, I would say, um, it does it does it in any way provide a protection against a wrongful stop, as I think we are hoping to try to accomplish. Representative Moskowitz, you're recognized to respond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's an excellent question. Okay. Uh, so understand what I'm doing within the amendment. And if the language is not correct, well, I'll fix it. But what I'm doing, so if someone reads it and sees something differently, tell me. What I'm doing in the amendment is a police officer still has to have probable cause and reasonable suspicion to even ask the question. But if he asks the question and you refuse, probable cause is now established. Okay? So what, all I'm doing is I'm pr protecting the officer on the back end. But if the officer asks you for your license and you give it to him and he did not have probable cause, that officer still has the issues that the bill protects. A follow-up, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Representative Moskowitz. Um, but, you know, it strikes me that we're cre that with this statute comes a new crime. And that crime is carrying a uh, open, openly carrying a weapon without a permit to do so. The question then becomes, how can the police officer establish probable cause when someone is just walking down the street, albeit without a permit? Um, to ask that person whether that person, or to, to investigate whether that person is violating this new crime. There's no way, I believe, for that to take place other than once the person commits some other activity that would mm -hmm. collaterally, through, by collateral investigation, uh, identify the person as a non-carrying um, non weapon, non-permit-carrying non, uh, individual. So the question still becomes, um, we are doing nothing through this amendment, unfortunately, because I, I think it's intriguing. We are doing nothing to um, to assist the police officer in identifying uh, who is carrying improperly, other than through some other activity. I, I mean, that's the weakness in your in in this in this effort, is it not? Representative Moskowitz, you're recognized to respond. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wouldn't consider it a weakness. Um, trying to thread a needle because I know if I go too far, it has no shot, okay? So that's why I'm not going further. I'm, we could sit here for 10 hours and debate issues. These things are, are, are go back and forth. What this amendment does is if an officer asks you, he has to have probable cause, he has to have reasonable suspicion. And if you give that license and the police officer did not have probable cause or reasonable suspicion, the police officer can be found individually liable Okay, but if you refuse, okay, probable cause will now be established and the police officer won't be individually liable. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make sure that police officers aren't thinking when they're walking down the street, if I ask that guy who I think might have some suspicion, but I don't really know, I want to give a police officer some protection that they're, they're not going to be individually sued. That's it. Any additional questions on amendment to amendment three? Seeing none, is there anyone who wishes to speak on amendment to amendment three? Seeing none, is there any debate on amendment to amendment three? Mr. Chair. Representative Gonzalez, you're recognized in debate. Just very briefly, I, I'm not 
com I'm not hostile to this amendment. I will vote no on this amendment right now uh, in deference to uh, Representative Gates because I, I recognize that there is an effort going on and an invitation for this effort to take place to help protect our police officers while also protecting uh, law-abiding citizens. Where I see, as as posed by my questions, and I will I will state it emphatically on on my on my um, debate, as stated by as as evidenced by my questions, my concern is that we are not giving through this amendment a conduit for the police, for our law enforcement officers, to identify who is who who there is probable cause to believe is not carrying appropriately other than through the breaking of another law and so for that reason i think this amendment is incomplete in its effort but um i would like to join you and representative gates in trying to uh, further address this problem for the floor and i thank you mr chair any additional debate on amendment to amendment three Representative Ray Winkle, Vassalinda, you're recognized in debate. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to vote for this amendment uh, because I think that it, the attempt to modify uh, the um, provision in the bill that I think went too far is is commendable. And uh, it may not be perfect at this point, and that is the problem sometimes with handwritten amendments. But what's great about handwritten amendments is it puts an idea forward, and it allowed uh, Chair Gates to say, uh, I will work with you on this. And so just to um, put to the record that I would like that to happen, I am going to vote for the amendment, whether it's voice or um, on the record. Uh, and. Um, and, and, and so I urge uh, Chair Gates and Representative Moskowitz to work together and um, Representative Rodriguez, and hopefully maybe I can uh, help as well. Thank you. Any additional debate on Representative Harrell, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, at this point, I'm going to oppose the amendment, although I do agree in concept with what you're trying to accomplish, Representative Moskowitz. I think uh, the chair has indicated his willingness to work with you. I just am very much afraid that when we vote for an amendment that is handwritten like this and it, it does not really perhaps solve the exact problem, we need further discussion. The sponsor of the bill has indicated his willingness to work with you so and I and others as well so at this point rather than put an imperfect amendment in it I think we should wait and see on the floor the final version that comes out and with that I will ask everyone to oppose it at this time looking for further change however any additional debate on the amendment to amendment representative Dudley you're recognized for debate Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is this is a good amendment. Law enforcement needs a safe harbor. This is a bad bill. Uh, this improves it somewhat. Helps to remove some of the chilling effect that law enforcement has when investigating these types of cases. Uh, we should definitely vote up on it and help law enforcement do the job to help keep us all safe. Thank you. Representative Metz, you're recognized in debate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to be very brief because Representative Harrell actually said exactly what I was planning to say as well. I think the uh, sponsor of the amendment, the amendment is well-intentioned and has a pretty sound concept in mind, but I'd hate to see us try to put language onto a bill that was drafted during the meeting by hand and that didn't have proper vetting. So I would recommend that we vote down on the amendment to the amendment and give the opportunity to the sponsor and the, of the amendment to the amendment to work with the sponsor of the main bill to work out appropriate language on this issue before the floor, and then we can take it up there, and that way we don't have to worry about correcting language that was hurriedly prepared. So while I applaud the efforts of the sponsor of the amendment to amendment, I'm going to vote against it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Any additional debate on the amendment to amendment three? Uh, before we go to the close on the amendment to amendment three, um, I'm going to take this opportunity just uh, as many of you know, and I've mentioned before, uh, the chair does not look favorably upon handwritten amendments, and specifically because of the unintended consequences of handwritten amendments, and that the members generally don't have the opportunity to uh, analyze and, and make uh, 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 a good judgment on the handwritten amendment. Um, regardless of 
what it might appear on its face as to whether it is a good amendment or not. So I just, I really wanted to take this opportunity, not specifically as to Representative Moskowitz, and I know that there are times when we do have to do handwritten amendments and that it's necessary to do so, but it should be the exception rather than the rule. And I want to take an opportunity to mention that before we give you an opportunity to close. Representative Moskowitz, you're recognized to close. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, it gives me no pleasure to do a handwritten amendment to Chair Gates's bill uh, at, at all, uh, especially because uh, you know I, I, he's been working on this for a long period of time. He's got all the sides, to, uh, you know, the, as, as many sides as he could put together on an issue like this, a, and he's been he's been working it hard. And the only reason I did it is I do think Representative Wood did point out some ambiguity that could be fixed and to strengthen the bill. And I was I was getting uh, to to that needle. You know, the one thing about handwritten amendments that that in some of the comments that were made is I I sit in a lot of committees, and depending upon who does the handwritten amendment, they get on all the time. Uh, and, and so I, you know, I, I I don't you know this idea that you know, you know it needs more proper vetting and you know. I, you know, let, let's be honest, okay, sometimes handwritten amendments get done and there's no proper vetting and, and, and they get on. But, but listen, uh, because of the chairman, uh, uh, his feeling on handwritten amendments, and because uh, I know Representative Gates is a man of his word who said he will work on this issue, uh, and, I, and I believe that there is support for the concept uh, on the committee, uh, but lack of support uh, of doing it in this fashion, I will withdraw the amendment. Without objection, show the amendment withdrawn. All right, at this time, we are, will move to the substitute amendment. Now that we've got the strike all in proper posture. Ranking Member Kerner has brought the strike all amendment. Ranking Member Kerner, you are recognized to explain your substitute amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And. Uh, you know, we've had a contentious meeting so far. I, if we got to this amendment first, we may have, you know, resolved everything very quickly. Um, and I, Rules. I have talked with uh, Chairman Chairman Gates about this amendment, and um, I apologize to Chairman Baxley again, who's not here, uh, for not speaking with him on, on another amendment. Um, but with that said, this is a, a good amendment that has been uh, drawn to remove the open carry portion of of this bill. Uh, but it also goes further than that. Um, basically, it protects those licensed carriers from being arrested if they inadvertently or accidentally display their firearm in an unintentional and not deliberate and not done in a clearly open and obvious manner. Uh, it also goes farther than that, because the last thing that I want is my constituent who is lawfully carrying their weapon to be uh, arrested improperly. Uh, a person is immune from criminal arrest and prosecution, and there is actually a presumption. I'm not a big fan of presumptions, but uh, here we are. There is a presumption that the person has not violated this subsection. And it goes on even farther. If a person is arrested under this subsection and is acquitted or found not guilty, the charges are otherwise dismissed, null prost, the person may apply for a certificate of eligibility to expunge the criminal history. We certainly don't want any of our constituents having a negative mark on their criminal record uh, showing an arrest if, um, if they shouldn't have been arrested in the first place. And there are other provisions that are, that are just an important, uh, putting a duty on law enforcement to allow the concealed weapons license holder to uh, explain away the situation. Very common sense reforms. I've heard from the NRA. I've heard from uh, other members of this committee that were concerned about people being arrested improperly. I don't know of any examples. I've talked to my sheriff, talked to my chief of police. Going back to my days as a police officer, I, I can't imagine that ever happening. But, but God forbid it is happening. I don't want that to occur. And this amendment is a wonderful compromise that would make sure that never happens again. And that is the substitute amendment. Are there any questions on the substitute amendment? Speaker Hudson, you're recognized for a question on the substitute amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Representative Kerner, um, just curious, where are the uh, police chiefs on your amendment? Ranking member, you're recognized to respond. Yeah, you'd have to ask them, Speaker Hudson, but ask at your own peril. Any additional questions on the substitute amendment? Representative Harrell, you're recognized for a question. 
Thank you. And this is my usual question for the third time. Uh, presumably, and I just want a confirmation from the sponsor of the bill, this is an unfriendly amendment. Representative Gates, you recognize to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I do appreciate Chair Harrell you giving me the opportunity to weigh in on these amendments greatly. Representative Kerner is right. This amendment removes the open carry portion of the open carry bill, so I would ask you to oppose it. <laughs> Any uh, additional question of the substitute amendment sponsor? Seeing no questions, we do have public testimony. Uh, there are a number of public testimony, and mm -hmm. again, this is if you could st yes. stick to the substitute amendment and not be redundant to the previous public testimony. Uh, first is Lisa Henning, Fraternal Order of Police. <laughs> Waves in support. Next is Den <laughs> Dennis Strange, Orange County Sheriff's Office. Waves in support. Next is Bob Gutierrez, Florida Sheriff's Associations. Sheriff, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, the Florida Sheriff's Association. Uh, oops, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, the Florida Sheriff's Association uh, supports uh, Representative Kerner's amendment. Uh, this was something that was vetted and decided by the Legislative Committee uh, on a vote along with the President of the Association to support this amendment because we believe it solves the problem uh, that has been stated in the past through the testimony of the primary proponents of this bill. And what's been stated in the past is the problem here is current law. And the current law has a word in it that is ambiguous, and that word is briefly. And that it suscepts people, potentially, uh, to criminal penalties uh, because it is not defined and subject to interpretation if they briefly display the firearm. I and the members of the Florida Sheriff's Association never, never want to see anybody who's a lawful, law-abiding, concealed carry permit holder facing any consequence whatsoever for doing something they're trying to comply with. If they're trying to comply with the law, they should never face any sanctions. And we believe this bill, by requiring that it be done in a deliberate, intentional, open, obvious way for there to be a violation, clearly with no temporal proximity, no briefly, no ambiguous words, there is no violation of the law unless it's done intentionally in an open and obvious way. And a law enforcement officer is required to inquire of the person and give them an opportunity to explain why it was not intentional, why it was not open and obvious, why it was not deliberate. And if the law enforcement officer <coughs> makes an arrest and they should have believed that, then the jury can't convict and it creates a presumption. So we believe this provides very, very strong, strong protections for Florida's concealed carry permit holders, treats them differently and specially than others, as it should be, and that this uh, good amendment uh, fixes the problem of anybody being held accountable when they shouldn't be. Thank you, Sheriff. Next is Craig Kahn, Florida League of Cities. Mr. Kahn, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Craig Kahn, League of Cities. And uh, based on my prior testimony relating to the current provision in the uh, uh, strike all relating to the rights, penalties, and the waiver of sovereign immunity and breadth of that, we support Representative Kerner's amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kahn. Next is Linda Geller Schwartz, National Council of Jewish Women. Ms. Geller Schwartz, you're recognized. Thank you. I'm speaking on behalf of my organization in support of this amendment. Our understanding was that the purpose of this bill was to ensure that if a concealed weapon was inadvertently displayed, this would not result in any significant legal consequences for the individual involved. The amendment seems to be a good compromise to protect both our law enforcement officers from unnecessary risk and our citizens from unnecessary legal hassles. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next is David Shep, Polk County Sheriff's Office. Okay. Next is Rob Bolera, Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. Waves in support. Next is Buddy Jacobs, State Attorneys. Mr. Chairman, State Attorneys, waves in support. Waves in support. Next is Amy Dance, National Council of Jewish Women. Waves in support. Next is Captain Jimmy Williams, Leon County Sheriff's Office. Waves in support. Next is Marion Hammer, NRA and United Sportsmen of Florida. Ms. Hammer, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, here we are again. 
it's truly deja vu. Opponents of the bill are trying to do the same thing they did in 2011. In 2011, we had a bill to allow concealed weapons license holders to also carry openly to stop abuse. That is NRA's big issue. That's not necessarily the issue of other people supporting this bill, but that was NRA's issue. The same people who are bringing forth this amendment brought forth almost the same amendment in 2011. Because when opponents to open carry realized they had no facts to support killing the bill, they offered an amendment that stripped out open carry and substituted a phony fix. In good faith, I agreed to that amendment against my attorney's advice. They told me don't take that amendment because it will not work. The only thing to stop people from being arrested for accidental or inadvertent or brief exposure of a firearm when you're carrying concealed is if you're allowed to carry openly. That is the only protection. But I agreed to the amendment against advice. Representative Chris Dorworth had the House bill. Senator Greg Evers had the Senate bill. And I'm sure they'll both tell you how we all got duped. My granddaddy used to say, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, this time I'm not fooled. I know what the deal is. This amendment strips out open carry, which is the only real solution, and it inserts entirely different language that really does nothing to eliminate the problem. It primarily restates existing law using district different language, but it effectively guts the bill. It totally wipes out the work product of the sponsors and the Police Chiefs Association and NRA with an amendment drawn by people who never came to the table when we were having all these discussions. It is not a compromise. Be clear, this amendment is not a compromise. This amendment is designed to cut the, cut, gut the bill. We ask you to vote against the substitute amendment and let's go forward with a good bill by Representative Gates. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ms. Hammer. I think you would be the, the best person to ask this. The 45 other states that have open carry laws and I don't expect you to do a, a full um, report here, but where do they fall between this amendment and uh, uh, Chair Gates's bill? The 45 states that have open carry, some have open carry, I think like 15 full open carry with no permit, no license. It breaks down but this was not the solution in 45 other states. 45 other states have open carry. So they don't have the problem we're having here in Florida. And as I said earlier, the only way to eliminate the problem is open carry. Next is Eric Friday, Florida Carry, Inc. Mr. Friday, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill is not only about accidental exposure. This bill is about a right. This bill is about openly carrying because people should have a choice how they carry their firearm. It's actually 30 states that have unlicensed open carry, even more liberal than what we're voting on here today. 
15 states require a license. Florida will join those 15 and become number 16 with the, without this amendment. This amendment is nothing more than a continuation of the efforts that the Florida Sheriff's Association has engaged in from the beginning. They have told, they have made claims that other cities or cities in other states do not have to allow open carry only if, where is, only if the person is not licensed. They have made claims that it will hurt tourism. Las Vegas, Nevada doesn't seem to have that problem where open carry is allowed. They have claimed that we are somehow different in here in Florida, that they won't know how to tell the good guys from the bad guys. Forty-five other jurisdictions law enforcement are apparently better trained than the Florida Sheriff's Association thinks their deputies are. This amendment is to gut the bill. This amendment is to try and oppose a right exercised by citizens of 45 other states, and we ask that you vote down this amendment. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Question, Representative Moskowitz has a question. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you referenced uh, Las Vegas as your example. Do you think Florida uh, should become like Las Vegas? Mr. Friday, you're recognized. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Chair. No, Representative, I'm not suggesting that Florida should become like, like Las Vegas or any other state. Florida should be like Florida is. However, the, the parade of horribles, the conjecture, the speculation about what might happen that the Florida Sheriff's Association has repeatedly told committees in this body might happen if Florida passes open carry has been complained of in many other states. In Oklahoma, which recently passed open carry, in Mississippi, and in Texas. And in each of these states, what has happened following the passage of open carry is, in the words of one sheriff in Texas, much ado about nothing. They expected 150 phone calls the first weekend. They got two. Another jurisdiction in Texas got none. One of these jurisdictions was Dallas-Fort Worth. I forget if they were the two or the none. We've, uh, the papers went back and talked to the Oklahoma sheriffs who had the same opposition and the same arguments against open carry that our sheriffs from Florida Sheriff's Association have raised and each one of them had to admit after a year of open carry in Oklahoma the problems they were concerned about had not manifested themselves because the reality is we're not going to suddenly see hundreds of people openly carrying on a daily basis. What we're probably going to see is what every other state has seen. People not feeling the need to put on their jacket when they get out of their car to pump gas. Another question, Mr. Chairman? Follow up. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you think uh, people should be allowed to openly carry in Disney World? <clears throat> You're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe that that is a question for, for example, that property owner. A property owner has a right to decide who does carrying. There's actually a Florida case on that where it went to the appellate courts, and they said, sorry, the law doesn't protect you when you're at your friend's house. I can't take off my jacket when, I'm, when I go to my friend's house and I'm concealed carrying. I can't take off my jacket because now I'm open carrying. There's no sense in this law. Last follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, follow-up. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, you don't believe there's a constitutional right to openly carry in Disney World? I think that's been asked to answer, but you're recognized to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe there's a constitutional right to open carry in public. I do not believe there's a con the Constitution generally has been interpreted not to impose requirements upon private parties on private property. And there's substantial 11th Circuit precedent on the point as well. Ranking Member Kerner, you're recognized for a question. question. Waves the question. All right. Briefly, Representative Dudley, you're recognized for a question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sir, uh, would you tell us, use, use an example of somebody showing a friend a firearm in their own house, and I, I wanted you to elaborate, what statute would that be violating, and how? where's the violation? Would you share with us, and do you have an example of somebody, somebody being arrested in those circumstances? Mr. Friday, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative, the, in the first part of your question, 790.25 Florida statute allows one to open carry at their home or place of business. Uh, that's the, the simple answer to the first part. There's a statute that allows uh, open carry at your home or place of business and specifically takes out, takes you out of the 790.053 open carry ban if you are at your home or place of business. But if you're not at your home or your place of business, for example, you're on just some other piece of property you own, 
the courts have held that that's not your home, it's not your place of business, so you're not within that exception to 790-053, and so now you've committed a crime. All right, thank you. Next, Mr. Chair. Do you have another question? Yes, thank you. Okay, remember, we've got a number of people who want to be heard, so you're recognized. I'm one of them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'm talking about the public. <laughs> uh, the public. Thank you, you very much. You will be. Public. Please, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please tell us what crime has been committed, what statute has been violated, if you could please. Could you tell us about that? And are you aware of that? of any particular individual ever being arrested, ever being in court on these, on these, or this kind of uh, alleged law violation? Yes, sir. Recognize yes. to respond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 790.053 is the law that would be violated. It 790.053 prohibits the openly carry, open carrying or open possession of a weapon. It doesn't require a rude, careless, or angry, or threatening manner. It just requires that you have the weapon openly. As for an example of a prosecution, I apologize, I cannot recall which DCA it came out of at this point, but there is a DCA case in Florida where the question arose that a person had an openly carried firearm at a friend's house and they were prosecuted and took it to the appellate court and the appellate court said, sorry, 790.25 exceptions do not apply at someone else's home, even with their permission. Thank you, Mr. Friday. Thank Next you, Mr. is Ryan Ramsey. SDL, the Florida Liberty Project. Mr. Ramsey, you're recognized. Thank you, sir. Good morning, and thanks for the opportunity to address this committee. Uh, my name is Ryan Ramsey. I'm on the National Council of the Sons and Daughters of Liberty, director of the Florida Liberty Project, and Bradford County Chair for the Libertarian Party of Florida. Shouldn't be too hard that I guess I'm here to talk about liberty. The last time this issue came up in 2011, I was full of facts and figures in my addresses to these committees. But Florida Carry and the NRA have documented the overwhelming factual evidence that this will likely increase public safety and most certainly poses no threat. You've heard from sheriffs like our own Gordon Smith, Sheriff Ivey, and others in these other hearings, probably later today, who put citizens' rights first and prove that the Sheriff's Association doesn't speak for every Leo in Florida. And everyone I ever met supports citizens carrying and would much rather find dead bad guys than hurt citizens. What I'm here to do is ask that you take a step back and think about what the Bill of Rights really means and how it applies to this issue. Freedom of speech is not there because the founders worried about a restaurant menu or a sign on a business. It is there for the radical speech, the edgy speech, the new thinkers that advance a culture but tend to irritate the powers that be in their times, those who end up in gulags in other countries, and those who are American heroes. Religious freedom is enshrined not for your local Baptist church, but for the religion that might irritate people. The room is full of Christians here, but at one time, Christians were fed to the reliance, and they were a persecuted minority. So our system was designed to prevent this from happening again. You can be arrested in Europe for saying things that the government doesn't allow. You can be blown up by some cultures for a cartoon. This is a special place, and these freedoms are priceless and hard won through a whole lot of blood, sweat, and tears. So these principles lie at the root of our Constitution, and they're the grand sum of millennia of trial and error resulting in the social contract that forms as this law of the land. So the majority cannot vote away the rights of the minority, and that is the heart of our republic. The right to keep and bear arms is enshrined in the Bill of Rights. Keep and bear means to own and carry, and shall not be infringed is pretty clear language. So to those of you in the committee inclined to vote against this bill, or vote for this amendment that would gut the bill, I can only hope to appeal to your basic sense of being an American. Free speech means some people make terrible music or say offensive or vulgar things. And every religion I can think of was once persecuted. You were once persecuted if you thought the earth was not flat. So you may not like guns, and you may not carry guns, but you don't have the right to tell me how to carry my lawful means of self-defense any more than you may dictate my religion or censor my speech. It doesn't say inalienable rights except by the Florida legislature. It says shall not be infringed. So this vote, for if you're on the fence or considering accepting this amendment, can be an act of tolerance for your fellow Americans and a chance to show some intellectual honesty. You can stand out and say that liberty isn't partisan, and we're going to give a favorable vote, even if we're a little freaked out. Why? Because the power of our American identity lies in respecting those not like us. It lies in the defense of the rights of those we disagree with and do not understand. So I urge the committee to vote favorable on this bill. It is the right thing to do and the only thing that honors the oaths we have all taken and in the least restrictive form that it is offered. Next is, okay, Representative Ray Winkle, that's Linda. You're recognized. Sir? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Go ahead. You have a question. question. Yes, and I appreciate your testimony. And um, 
have I have a question. What if you have a timid tax collector in uh, that um, is presenting a tax situation to a citizen who has a 357 strapped to their holster, and they're not they're concerned and chilled about. Uh, moving forward with telling that citizen that has come to the desk that they um, uh, may owe a, a large tax bill. Can you just talk about that that piece of tolerance for the, the, the timid tax collector? Well, I think that... Oh, thank you. Um, I think that the tax collector, uh, especially, you know, they'd be a constitutional officer. I think they should understand, you know, that their obligation is to respect others' rights. You know, the, the guy with the purple mohawk next to you in line might make you uncomfortable, but we can't arrest him. Um, at one time, you know, it was uncomfortable when they saw an interracial couple, you know, but we don't, we have to have to get over it because our rights are, are, are paramount. Follow up. I guess what I'm thinking is that what if the tax collector, collector just sees the, the fellow or the woman with the 357 strapped to their and just doesn't then continue on with what they need to do and they, they are chilled in putting forward their constitutional uh, responsibility of collecting that tax bill? You're recognized to respond. I don't know of any case where a tax collector was threatened by a, a lawful concealed carry permit holder. Their record, as, as stated by others, is, is absolutely stellar, and we're the nicest people you probably will ever meet. Okay. All right. Next is uh, Clarence Morrison. Wave in opposition. Next is Wayne Ivey, Sheriff. Sheriff, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, a member of the committee. I think like most of you and everybody in this room, I have amendment vertigo right now. <laughs> in previous sessions, myself and numerous other sheriffs have stood at this very podium and encouraged legislators to support and pass open carry in the state of Florida. Today, you heard Sheriff Bob Galateri stand up here and say he represents the Florida Sheriff's Association that opposes open carry and also supports this amendment to the proposed bill. Well, I don't represent the Florida Sheriff's Association, who took a blind vote of its members to see if they wanted to support or oppose this bill that is designed to protect good, law-abiding citizens. I also don't represent the Florida Source Sheriff's Association that stands here today to support an amendment that guts a vital and extremely important crime prevention bill that last fall the association overwhelmingly voted to not be involved in during their annual legislative agenda workshop in Lake Mary. During that meeting, the majority of sheriffs in the state of Florida voted to not make any gun bills a legislative priority this year for the FSA, yet here they stand today telling you that they are the leading authority on gun bills, telling you that you should listen to their ideas about open carry that they never even got involved in until they saw the bill racing through the various legislative committees on its way to the governor's office. While I don't represent the FSA on this matter, I instead proud, proudly represent the citizens of the state of Florida and a growing number of Florida sheriffs who have been courageous enough to go against the FSA to stand in defense of our citizens' constitutional rights. I represent a group of Florida sheriffs who feel so strongly about the significance and impact of this legislation that they stood against their friends and fellow sheriffs to demonstrate their strong conviction to the Constitution and protection of their citizens. I want you to know that I am truly proud to be a member of the FSA and to call Legislative Chair Bob Galateri my friend, as well as the other sheriffs and representatives that are here today. But I will not sit idly by and watch a critical bill to protect our citizens be watered down simply because someone in the FSA decided to oppose it. If this bill did nothing else, it restores the constitutional rights of our citizens to have a choice to openly carry a firearm or carry a firearm in a concealed fashion. This bill, however, does so much more. It serves as a great and profound crime prevention tool it fixes a problem in the existing law, and it gives our citizens the ability to protect them and their families long before law enforcement arrives and long before multiple murders have occurred. As I said before, this bill is about giving our citizens what they already ha are guaranteed, the choice to protect themselves and their family by opening care and a firearm to alert bad people mm -hmm. that this is not a gun-free zone where citizens are sitting ducks waiting for the cavalry to arrive. It is a known fact that the best law enforcement agencies in the country have response times in minutes, yet violent criminals can take our lives in seconds. San Bernardino, California is a stark reminder and perfect example of that fact. 
Law enforcement officers arrived on scene within four minutes of the incident being called in to 911. Sheriff. Yes, sir. If, if you could go ahead and yes, sir. it up, I'd appreciate it. I'd like to point out they arrived to find 14 people dead and many others wounded. As a veteran of law enforcement for almost 37 years, my reasons for supporting this bill is very simple. First and foremost, I don't want our citizens to have to defend an attack. I want them to prevent it from ever happening by showing themselves as a hard target. Secondly, the Constitution guarantees citizens the right to bear arms, and additionally, in-depth studies have demonstrated that criminals are far less likely to attack someone they know is armed. It's about crime prevention for me. It's about fixing the other parts of the bill as well. This is about law enforcement also having a mutual voice in the drafting of this bill so that it protects our citizens, our law enforcement officers, and our constitutional rights. In closing, I would like to ask you to vote in opposition of this amendment and support this bill in its draft form so that our citizens can protect themselves when seconds count. Mr. Chairman, one quick question. Yeah, Representative Moskowitz, you're recognized for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Only one question. Uh, you mentioned San Bernardino in, in your speech. Do you think the San Bernardino shooter should be able to have a concealed weapons permit and openly carry? Because under, under the strike all, the San Bernardino shooter would be able to have a concealed weapons permit and openly carry. I think if the, I'm sorry, sir, I apologize. I think if the person qualifies under the criteria of the concealed carry as 790 points out, then yes, sir. But I also think that uh, the people in that room deserve the right to protect themselves and, quite frankly, are going to be the first line of defense when that time comes. Yeah, yeah you're recognized. Thank you. Representative Dudley, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just briefly, uh, Sheriff Ivey, uh, could you elaborate? You mentioned uh, you support and some sheriffs support uh, this uh, open carry. Bill, what do you know of the 67 sheriffs in, in the uh, state, what the count is, how many are for and against? Um, I can tell you that when the blind vote was taking place, we were told that it was um, 47 opposed, I believe was the number. Um, several uh, abstained from voting and 10 supported it. However, I can also tell you that since that time, other sheriffs have reached out for me and told me that with the amendments the Florida Police Chiefs Association put on it, they can now support that bill as well. I can't tell you how many people support the amendment um, that the FSA gave to Representative Kerner because they never asked us if we support it. Follow up. So if I heard you right, you said 47 were opposed to open carry, 10 supported it, 10, 10 abstained, is that right? I believe it You're was, yes sir. yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Okay. Next is Nick Finch. I don't think I could have said better than Sheriff. I'm a Sheriff Finch, Liberty County. I oppose the amendment. I support it. Okay. Waves in opposition on the substitute amendment. Gordon Smith, Sheriff. Absolutely. <laughs> sheriff, you're recognized. Yes, sir. I come before you today to let you know that I am one of those sheriffs that support the open carry. I'm also one of those sheriffs in opposition to Kerner's amendment. The reason for that is you can't stand up here and say, I support the Second Amendment, but. Because I challenge you to go home and tell your spouse, I love you, but. That's not going to work. I assure you of that. And this amendment is like a glass of sweet tea that you've left sitting too long before dinner. It's still a glass of sweet tea, but it's all watered down and don't taste real good. This amendment is nothing more than a carry-on, reworded a little bit, that we did in 2011. Challenge you. Google it. You'll find law-abiding citizens arrested all the time. Just happened in Citrus County. Nice video of it. You see what happens. I'm in opposition to this because I won't say that I've been lied to, but some people haven't been truthful about the way this thing's been presented. So I'm with a growing number of sheriffs that when the police chief sat down and worked out a couple of things that concerned them, that vote was taken before that occurred, even though we know that on that day it was being amended. Let's be fair and let's be real honest. Now, the growing number of sheriffs are supporting it because of the amendments of the Florida police chiefs. We didn't take account of the sheriffs before we said we support this amendment that Kerner brought forward. I thank you, and uh, let's support the Second Amendment. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Question. Chair, question? All right. Uh, Ranking Member Kerner, you're recognized for a question. 
Chair Smith. Um, where do we draw the line? I mean, you gave a passionate speech about the Second Amendment that, that you know, with all due respect, sir, I, I've heard many times, yet I don't see you or any sheriff stand up here and testify that we need to allow our constituents to carry an AR-15 openly. They do it now if you know the law. You're recognized. I'm sorry. If you know it now, when I stop him toting that AR-15, there's a loophole. Because all you got to do is say, I'm going fishing or I'm going camping. That's the loophole. This right here fixes the open carry with having to produce a concealed weapons permit. Anybody that's been a street cop long enough understands that. And I live in a rural area. People hunt and fish all the time, and people tote guns all the time. That's why we're one of the safest counties in the state, by the way. But I'll, I'll leave it with sure. that. But that's, that's where, where do we end? Okay? It's like legalizing drugs. Where do we end? So, uh, follow up. You're, you're recognized for a follow up. I, I live in South Florida, as do many of, of the members on this committee. Uh, and if I understand your testimony correctly, the, the sheriff of, of Bradford County believes that it is lawful to openly carry an AR 15 in West Palm Beach, Florida, or Miami Dade County, or Broward County. We're talking about the concealed weapons. I'm sorry. Sheriff. We're, we're talking about chair. concealed weapons permit right now, and the law. We're not talking about your amendment because it doesn't address that. But what we are talking about is the right for a person to openly carry a handgun in the same county, because the people in South Florida still have the same rights as the people in North Florida. All right. All right. Thank you, Sheriff. Mr. Thank you. Next is Carlos. Mr. Chairman, I, well, I had a okay. question. All right, well, Representative Moskowitz. Let, let's stick to a question. I'm not referring to you specifically but what one question no follow-up that's my commitment you recognize uh, thank you mr chairman uh, i love the passion you gave you know, the logic behind is that it you know when i love someone it's I'd love there's no no but uh and it's the second amendment there's no but 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 isn't it true there's a lot of buts with the second amendment i mean do you support background checks and waiting periods all right to, uh, sheriff Go ahead, and you're recognized to respond, but let's try to leave some of this stuff for debate. You're recognized to We're respond. going to leave creating the demons to fight to some other day. This is about open carry, and let's leave it to the, the purpose of the bill. All right, next is, next is Carlos Guillermo Smith. Sir, we waive in support of Representative, uh, Representative Perner's good amendment and actually representing myself. Thank you. Thank you. Waves in support. Okay, at this time, we are in... Debate. Okay. Do we have a? I don't think we've got an appearance card. Come, come on up. Come on up. Huh? The what? Yeah. Right. Thank if you. you. Could, if you could go ahead and fill out an appearance card, please. I did. Have we got one. Yep. Okay, Candace Eriks. Debbie Harrison Rumberger, representing the League of Women Voters of Florida. You're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. At the League of Women Voters of Florida, we're wondering when our law enforcement officers became the enemy. We don't understand what this problem is that's being put forward by the National Rifle Association. The League of Women Voters of Florida stands proudly with the Florida Sheriff's Association in supporting this common sense alternative to open carry. The proposed amendment provides increased legal protection to concealed carry permit holders who inadvertently expose their firearms while not penalizing or criminalizing our law enforcement for taking care of the people, public safety, and doing their jobs. We hope that you will support this excellent amendment by Representative Kerner and follow the lessons that were learned in the most conservative legislative session under Representative Dean Cannon in 2011 and reject the bill that's been filed by Representative Gates. Thank you. We've got another appearance card, Candace Eriks. Seminole Sheriff's Office waves in support. Waves in support. Okay, members, uh, at this time we are on debate on the substitute amendment. We've got, we've got another appearance card, Michael Sheehan. 
Mr. Sheehan, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. The, uh, my reason for being here is I'm going to make several assumptions. I'm going to assume that open carry, if one's open carry, it's going to require a concealed carry permit. That'll be a given. Okay? Taking from that, let's, can we use history as a guide? If we go back to the concealed carry permit violations and revocations that have occurred from the year 1987 to, uh, to 2011, there have been 168 revocations because of firearms violations. And this is with a population base of 2 million concealed carry holders. 168 out of 2 million over a period of 24 years. This comes out to some given calculated number, and that's fine. But I would like to compare that number with the same specification when addressing sworn law enforcement officers. There is a third, there's a, I'm sorry, a 25%, there's, I'm sorry, a 25, there's a factor of 25 times that a concealed carry holder will be less likely to have a firearms revocation as opposed to a sworn law officer. If we cannot use history as a guide to show us the path forward, then what, in fact, are we doing? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, members, now we are in debate on the substitute amendment. <laughs> Anyone wish to debate the substitute amendment? Seeing no debate, uh, Ranking Member Kerner, you're recognized to close on the substitute amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And let's dispatch with the, the theory that this bill is about the Second Amendment of the Constitution. Let's also understand, because it never comes up, I don't even think that most of the uh, people that either oppose or support the amendment or, or the bill overall understand that there is a very strong provision of our Florida Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, that guarantees Floridians the right to bear arms. And the last sentence of that provision is that the manner in which those arms shall be right uh, the manner in which you bear arms shall be regulated by law, statutory law. So I, I get that Chairman Gates wants open carry. I understand that the NRA uh, wants open carry because they don't want Floridians being arrested unlawfully. I understand that there is dissension between the Sheriff's Association and the Police Association internally and externally and within the profession as well. Uh, and, and I took a cheap shot at the Chiefs of Police Association, and I apologize for that. It, it was really meant just to highlight the dissension that is going on within this profession. And it's a healthy, healthy dialogue. And I don't think Chairman Gates meant to have uh, so, such contention within the profession, but it's a healthy dialogue. But this amendment, if anything is clear today, it is that Florida is not ready for open carry. I have seen things today that have blown my mind. I've seen elected sheriffs stand up and, and vote against or wave in opposition against an amendment to protect their deputies. I've seen chairmen of this committee ask us to withdraw amendments, and that's fine. We, we want to play fairly, and, and we want to be uh, fair and notice given. But we have seen things happen today that suggest that we are in a state of crisis when it comes to this policy, both as a committee, both as a community, and as a state. This amendment will resolve the issues that have been put forth that are not constitutional in nature, because I promise you, the state has the authority to tell you that you can't open carry a firearm. And if that's in dispute in this committee meeting, you're in the wrong room. You need to go to the Florida Supreme Court. You need to go to the third branch of this government, which has already decided this issue. We talk about people are getting arrested unlawfully. Where are they? Who has testified that these good police officers and deputy sheriffs have dishonored their oaths and are arresting people unlawfully and against our Constitution? They are not here because it's not happening. What we didn't hear is the Chiefs of Police Association stand up and say they're against this, am this amendment. Now, sure, we have had some sheriffs stand up, and I respect their opinion. In fact, my relationship with Sheriff Smith goes, goes way back. And I have a deep respect for what he's done for law enforcement. I have a deep respect for the positions that Sheriff Finch has taken in his career to stand up for the Second Amendment. He's borne a burden that most people don't know about. But this is a policy discussion that we're having today as to whether the state of Florida is ready for this policy. And if anything has demonstrated that more clearly 
then this committee, I want to see it because this committee does not, is not ready to pass this. Now, now they may pass this, this bill today, but I'll tell you that this policy is not ready to be implemented in a Florida law. And there's going to be some tough votes taken today. So let's, let's talk about, just for a second, doing it in a way that is rational. I heard that from, I think, uh, Chairman Wood down there earlier in this conversation. If we want to really move in this direction, let's do it in baby steps. Let's do it in a rational way. Let's not do it in a way that subjects, subjects our law enforcement officers to unneeded risk, both to their personal safety and their career. Let's protect our constituents. Let's make sure they're not getting arrested for lawful activity. This amendment does all that. Please support this amendment. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member. Uh, Ranking Member Kerner, having closed on this amendment, members, uh, uh, if Representative uh, Ranking Member Kerner's amendment is adopted, it will replace uh, Representative Gates' amendment. If it's not adopted, then we're going to continue with the consideration of Representative Gates' uh, amendment. So all those in favor of the substitute amendment, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying nay. Nay. Nays have it. Two hands, Mr. Chair. Two hands being uh, shown. Michelle, please call the roll. Chairman McBurney? No. Representatives Burton? No. Dudley? Yes. Edwards? Fant? No. Gonzalez? No. Harrell? No. Hudson? Absolutely not. Kerner? Yes. Metz? No. Moskowitz? Absolutely. Pasadomo? No. Plakin? No. Ray Winkle Vasilinda? No. Rodriguez? Yes. Stone? No. Trujillo? No. Wood? No. Fails, Chairman. Uh, show that the substitute amendment fails. We are now back on uh, Representative Gates' uh, amendment. Uh, so at this time, we are now in debate on just on the substitute amendment. Is there any debate on the substitute amendment? Seeing no debate on the substitute amendment, Representative Gates, your rec I'm, I'm sorry, strike all. <laughs> Thank you, members. Uh, Re Representative Gates waves on the strike all on his amendment. Uh, all those in favor of the strike all signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying nay. Show that the ayes have it. We are now back on the bill as amended. Are there any question? Uh, are there any questions on the bill as amended? All right. Seeing no questions on the bill as amended, we do have some appearance cards on the bill as amended. Given our time, I'm going to restrict that, and because we've had a significant amount of debate relative to aspects of the bill to one minute. So we're back on the bill. First is Bob Gutierrez, Sheriff. Sheriff, you're recognized for one minute. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> While there have been improvements to this bill, a couple of the concerns that the Florida Sheriff's Association has in still opposing it is the holster requirement does not require a security or retention holster. And it allows a gun to be partially or wholly concealed in a bag. While that could be a fanny pack or a purse, it could also be a paper bag or a Publix bag stuck in your pocket. There is no retention requirement. It's not much different than not having a holster requirement at all. The prohibition against infringing on rights has been discussed, continues to be vague, and can cause significant uh, confusion. Uh, importantly, as Representative Kerner mentioned, this is not about the uh, Second Amendment rights because the Florida Constitution clearly allows the legislature to regulate the manner in which uh, a firearm could be carried. We still oppose it because of public safety issues, and we believe that it will cause situations where law enforcement officers are unable to determine the good guy carrying the gun from the bad guy. It will actually make concealed carry permit holders who are openly carrying a target. It will not harden them. It will actually make them a target. So we believe that uh, there are significant public safety issues. This is not good for Florida, and that's why we oppose the bill. Thank you, Sheriff. Next is Greg Pound. Mr. Pound, you're recognized for one minute. 
Thank you, Chair and members. Um, as a candidate for Pinellas County Sheriff's Department, um, 2012, the constituents wanted to, wanted to know that the sheriffs were going to defend our rights to carry arms, carry and bear arms. Robert Guattari here, that just stood up here, was one of the sheriffs from the Sheriff's Department candidates, three lawyers from the Sheriff's Department I ran against. And one of the, their own deputy said when his lips are moving, he's lying. Now when we Mr. have Pound, deputies, Pound, please Pound, let me speak. Pound. You Mr. give me Pound, you'll one stick minute. To the bill. Mr. Pound, if you'll stick to the bill. Okay, well everyone else is talking about people calling names. I ran for sheriff. Robert Guattari was one of the three lawyers that ran from the Sheriff's Department that I ran against. And the constituents, the people in the Sheriff's Department said, when this man's mouth's moving, he's lying. And I'm going to ask you to stick to the bill. Okay. The, our Constitution gives us a right to bear arms. And when officers take a... Yeah, he's, he's pointing to the time on it. Yeah, come on, brother. You guys are choking the life out of, the, out of we the people. You're supposed to be the head. We elected you to represent us, and you're choking. You're, there needs to be a separation because you guys are not representing the people. You become traitors to the American people. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Next is Captain Charles Brown, Volusia County Sheriff's Office. Next is Joe West, Florida State Council, Vietnam Veterans of America. Next is Teresa Saff, Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense of America. Ms. Saff, you're recognized for one minute. Good morning. My name is Teresa Saff. I am a mom and a volunteer for the Florida chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. We are a grassroots um, uh, movement of American mothers fighting for common sense public safety measures that respect the Second Amendment while also protecting Americans from gun violence. I am here today representing the Florida moms who oppose House Bill 163 which would allow individuals to openly carry handguns in public places. I want to direct the committee's attention to the concerns that we have in regard to open carrying of handguns in Florida. If this bill passes, anyone with a permit to carry a concealed handgun would be allowed to openly carry the gun at places that my family and children will frequently go. There's no hard evidence that the open carry Ms. Saff, if you could conclude, please. Fire You're over a deter crimes. As a mother, I would be forced to decide if a person openly carrying a gun in a local grocery store is an enforcement agency, an activist, making a statement, or a dangerous criminal. Unfortunately, if this bill passes, I will be forced to do it. Thank you, Ms. Saff. I urge you to vote against it. Thank you. Next is Eric Friday. Mr. Friday, you recognize for one minute. Since 1987, we've heard the arguments. This will happen. That will happen. Another thing will happen if we pass this bill or that bill that allows citizens of Florida to have their right to possess a firearm, to carry a firearm in a particular place, to carry a firearm in a particular manner. Not once since 1987 has been anybody been able to show that the fear-mongering claims have actually come true. Not one piece of evidence has been presented that any of the claims of the Sheriff's Association of people without retention holders having their retention holsters having their guns stolen or people being targeted first. Not one example of that. There is an example from uh, north of Atlanta where a a group of individuals went in to rob a Waffle House, saw a couple of uh, Georgia citizens who were openly carrying, because they're allowed to carry up there, and the criminals turned around and walked out. The citizens figured out what was going on, called the police. They were apprehended just a few blocks it's away. Friday, if you could conclude. In 1987, this ban was passed without a single committee hearing, without a single opportunity for public comment. It's been vetted today. And it's time that this ban goes away. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Friday. Next is Jan Rubina, Florida League of Women Voters. <coughs> Waves in opposition. Next is Debbie Harrison Rumberger, Florida League of Women Voters. We strongly Thank you, Ms. Rumberger. Waves in opposition. Next is Brian Lupiani, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Okay, thank you. Waves in opposition. Next is Michael Sheehan. 
waived in, in support. Waves in support. Next is Tim Stanfield, Florida Police Chiefs Association. Police Chiefs waves in support. Waves in support. Next is Craig Kahn, Florida League of Cities. Okay, waves in opposition. Next is Marion Hammer, NRA and Unified Sportsman of Florida. Ms. Hammer, you are recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to point out that between 1892 and 1987, Florida had open carry, almost 100 years, and there were no problems. 45 other states currently have open carry, and they don't have problems. Speculation, supposition, predictions, and the parade of horribles isn't evidence. It's just plain, creative hyperbole with no basis in fact. Further, most license holders will never carry openly, but if they do, they won't cause a problem. And how do I know that? Because if they cause problems, they will lose their license, and then they can't carry concealed or openly. Please support this bill. Thank you, Ms. Hammer. Next is Carlos Guillermo Smith. I believe in opposition, representing myself. Waves in opposition. Next. And we done before. Okay, Michael Sheehan. You've already seen. Already no, we've, I think we've already had you. Done that one. Okay. That one's already been done. Gordon Smith. Strongly wave in support of the bill. Thank you. Sir. Waves in support. Uh, Nick Finch. Waves in support. Wayne Ivey. Waves in support. Clarence Morrison. Okay, thank you. Ryan Ramsey. Okay, Mr. Ramsey, you're recognized for one minute. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, as far as the commentary about the Florida Constitution allowing our rights to be regulated in some manner, it should be regulated based on the facts, and it should be regulated based on the history, and it should be regulated in light of the Second Amendment that it's basically copying. And second of all, I um, heard two comments uh, from, from Kerner, over here, Representative Kerner and, and Chair Wood, about the sheriffs voting against their own interests, I think what they're saying is they are competent to train their officers to respect the rights of the citizens that they're charged with serving and protecting. And I think that's kind of insulting to basically what they're trying to do is put forth an amendment to give immunity to sheriffs and police chiefs to not train their officers and uh, let them just go ahead and run roughshod over people's rights. And if you're scared of that accountability, I don't think you're qualified for that job. Next is Craig Kahn, Board of League of Cities. All right, I know he hasn't testified. Buddy Jacobs, State Attorneys. <clears throat> Mr. Jacobs, you're recognized for one minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, as I approach the, uh, I'm two days away from the 40th anniversary of my 33rd birthday. <clears throat> and I would assure you that I'm here to give you a little history and a little fact. In 1987, inadvertently, the legislature passed open carry. And guess what happened? Uh, just a few months later, because of the outcry of the people of Florida, they came back up here in one day and did pass it to, to close it again because the governor called uh, us, the legislature, into session because it was a disaster. The Los Angeles Times, October the 17th, in their newspaper said, this is, this is the OK Corral. Florida's the OK Corral. People down there walking around with guns. We're a family-friendly state for vacationers. We're not Las Vegas. We're a family-friendly state. And have guns walking around with people in schools and people, tourists who are going to be in Florida. Let me tell you, I've been here. We've done it. And that's what happened. You don't have to think about it. It really happened. And we're facing it again. I hope that y'all will defeat this bill. Thank you, Mr. Jacobs. Okay, at this time we are in debate. Does anyone wish to debate the bill? Yes, sir. Representative Dudley, you're recognized in debate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
So even open carry in the Wild West was regulated. Uh, historically, there's abundant proof that people riding into town, of course, you were able to have your rifles, your long guns, your pistols, whatever, when you're crossing the country. But in most of the old western towns, the guns had to be checked with a sheriff. And that was because uh, the sheriffs and the town people wanted greater safety in their towns. And that has been a boom to uh, commerce and industry and so on to allow or to uh, regulate in, in a safe way the carrying of guns. That That is our responsibility. The correction for the inadvertent showing of a gun uh, was offered here. The Kerner Amendment clearly offered a resolution for that problem. And, you know, the parade of horribles about it uh, being a trick and so on is very interesting, but uh, it not one named person was mentioned that has been prosecuted as a mistake where the statute already has uh, a provision to uh, correct any issues with that. And so here we offer an additional uh, remedy to the problem, but instead we have this bill, which is uh, basically completely eviscerating law enforcement's ability to safeguard the people, to uh, brush back and cause a chilling effect on law enforcement from doing their jobs and helping to keep us safe. This is a very draconian measure. Uh, this is the sunshine state, not the gunshine state. We do depend, our number one industry is tourism. You know, how much work has been done in researching the attitudes and feelings of uh, all the visitors that we have coming to our state? That's our number one industry. Seven billion dollars approximately uh, in, in tourism dollars. Uh, the people from all over the world come here. So, and, you know, we, we touched on hospitals. Uh, private hospitals you can keep guns out of. Public hospitals, oh, it's, you know, bring your gun, no problem. Hospitals are places where dramatic things happen. Life decisions are made. Uh, very often great, you know, greatly controversial issues are uh, discussed amongst family members and, and others. So, you know, is this a great idea? We're going to have guns in our public hospitals, too. It's, uh, you know, on our beaches or wherever. It, it, this is a horrible idea. Uh, we need to uh, vote this bill down and stop it now. Thank you. Speaker Hudson, you're recognized in debate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have tremendous respect for our law enforcement uh, community around the state of Florida, be it uh, police chiefs or sheriffs. And listening to both um, groups today, you would, you would think that they weren't in the same business. Some say that this would be a tremendous crime prevention tool and crime deterrent. Some seem to think that it won't do anything at all. Well, that just strikes me to be a little uh, um, awkward to understand. How can one group of law enforcement officers say that it'll be a great crime prevention tool and one group of law enforcement officers say absolutely not? There must be something else there. And that's for them to unpack and figure out amongst themselves. Clearly there's some dissension in the, uh, in the ranks. But I do know this, that frankly, I came here uh, all about common sense. And to me, that's what it's all about, is common sense. Uh, yes, of course I support the Constitution. Yes, of course I support the Second Amendment, because I swore an oath of office. And my common sense tells me, and I've said this before, and I'll probably say it again somewhere along the line, but there are bad people in this world. And those bad people in the world are going to commit a crime whether we have a law for it or not. And they are always, always willing to follow the, the, the path of least resistance. 
and they're going to prey on the weak and defenseless. Just that simple. This strikes me as a way that we can make sure we have less defenseless people and prevent those people that would want to do harm to good people. I fully support what Representative Gates is trying to do, and I would hope that somewhere along the line, the law enforcement community could figure out how to uh, come up with a unified message, because frankly, it's a little disconcerting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any additional debate? Yes. Representative Rodriguez, you're recognized in debate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I won't be supporting this bill. Probably a shocker to you, uh, Chair Gates. Um, I, I was going to preface it by mentioning your willingness to work on certain things, and that usually signals that someone's voting no or opposing your bill. Uh, but I did appreciate you being able to work on narrowing part of the <clears throat> provisions in an earlier stop. Uh, but f from my perspective, the only fix that's really needed, um, if any, is, is what the Sheriff's Association was mentioning in terms of just the word briefly um, when we're talking about um, inadvertent display. Uh, again, we haven't seen any evidence in any of the testimony today that that's actually happened, but to the extent that there are concerns, first, Second Amendment concerns with that word briefly and that um, that could potentially cause some problems, uh, I think that's something that uh, most of us would be willing to fix. But that, that's not what this bill is. Um, I think that to the extent that my understanding that was sort of the problem statement um, where a lot of this came from. Uh, the bill obviously has gone very far afield um, toward open carry. Uh, and um, it, it just, f f from my vantage point, um, if, if that's the problem that we're hearing, uh, I am not hearing a clamor um, uh, for uh, open carry. Simply, uh, you know, obviously uh, social media and, um, and interest groups uh, with mailing lists aside, um, that's just simply not something I'm hearing. But what I am hearing from constituents is concern and fear. And I don't know that this is the moment. Um, and a lot of that fear may be uh, ill-founded in terms of, you know, this. I, I don't personally believe that, you know, if we have open carry, it will be the apocalypse. But uh, you, you do hear that from many people who are, who are very frightened about that possibility of open carry, um, especially in urban areas. I know that in rural areas it's a little different, but in urban areas where many of us are from. So I, 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 I'm voting no just simply because we're, we're not addressing an actual problem um, that, uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, and if there is a problem, it's, it's the word briefly, um, but obviously that's not what we're dealing with today. So thank you. Representative Ray Winkle Vaslunda, you're recognized in debate. Thank you. I'm going to be voting for um, this bill today, uh, and I believe that um, Chair Gates will be um, is is good to his word, and we've worked together before, and will modify the one provision that gave me some angst. I wish I was also voting on Representative Woods' amendment, um, but uh, with the legislature. Uh, but we're not. Um, I'm voting for the bill because 45 other states have seemed to have no difficulty with this. I'm voting for the bill because um, the underpinning of the bill is not only the Second Amendment uh, that deserves great respect, just like the First Amendment does as well, um, but uh, because the the second underpinning um, and it's, it's appropriate to regulate the First Amendment. You can't yell fire in a crowded theater. But we also have concealed weapon permit uh, laws in this state. And this is hooked to that. And so, as Mr. Sheehan said, and I guess we saved the best for last, um, he reminded us that um, concealed permit weapon holders are infinitely almost law-abiding. Law and so on that basis, I'll be voting for this bill. Thank you. Representative Wood, you're recognized in debate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, um, I would direct you to lines uh, 87 of the strike hall. I think this is really the most important uh, part of this bill. A declaration of policy. The legislature finds as a matter of public policy, in fact, that the possession and carrying of weapons and firearms by law-abiding individuals for lawful purposes, including self-defense, enhances public safety, and then it goes on to uh, talk about why that is. That is strong. 
that reflects the type of society that we are. And that's why I am going to support this bill. Um, I do have concerns, as, and, and, and they're, they're principled concerns, um, uh, concerning the amendment that I filed. Um, and I was glad that uh, Representative Mos Moskowitz uh, followed up with a, another amendment, and I was glad to hear that uh, Representative Gates uh, is interested in addressing uh, some of these concerns. Um, I'm, I heard the, uh, the representative of the NRA, you know, eloquently state why she thinks that we need to go forward with a penalty at this particular time. Maybe we can get that language clear enough so that we know exactly what we're talking about. And, and this is, you know, not that I'm against this great bill. I'm just, you know, a lawyer. And words matter. And policy matters in terms of getting very clearly what we want to do so that we do not infringe on the rights of, of our public safety um, infrastructure. So, um, Representative Gates, let's let's continue to work um, and and have a great uh, a great a greater bill when we reach the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Gonzalez, you're recognized in debate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to be supporting this bill because it does address the problem. And the problem is that we all have, the problem is that in light of the fact that we all have a God-given right to carry weapons openly, how do we regulate that appropriately? At this point in our statutes, I do not see how our laws appropriately regulate our ability and our right to openly carry a weapon. If this is a family-friendly state, Mr. Chair, then it's a family-friendly state partly because we would be allowed to have our families carry weapons in their own defense. We would be allow allowed to have the knowledge that we will be able to use significant weapons to allow us to defend ourselves against harm and, and threats to our personal bodies and our properties. I voted against the substitute am amendment because although it is a substitute amendment, it is not a substitute for open carry, which is the problem that's before us. Not that, sub not that open carry is a problem. The problem is how do we appropriately regulate the God-given right that we have to openly carry a weapon for, amongst other reasons, our self-defense. I commend Chairman Gates in, um, in tackling this problem head on. Now, interestingly, you have stumbled upon another problem uh, with the holstering, uh, I'm sorry, with the, uh, with the private property provision. Yes, I agree with some of the uh, prior speakers that a private property owner does have the right to decide whether someone should be openly carrying a gun in his or her property. However, now we are identifying that there, that there is now a different way in which the statute would, um, would handle a different class of organizations designed to uh, make and provide the same service or product, and that is specifically as it relates to hospitals. Now we have some hospitals who are public, which are public hospitals and some hospitals which are pub privately owned. From my standpoint, I think we should treat them all equally, whether that means that they should be gun-free zones, which I inherently opposed, or whether they should all be equally openly uh, open carry zones, which uh, I probably believe I'm closer to that point, um, is a matter for separate debate. But I do believe that those organizations that for somehow as an ancillary effect of this bill are now being treated differently merely because they are private versus public uh, needs to be addressed. And I look forward to working uh, with you, Chairman Gates, on, on this issue as well. With that said, I fully uh, hope and uh, ask everyone to support this uh, bill and move this process forward so that we can appropriately regulate the God-given right that we all have to openly carry weapons. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, Ranking Member Kerner, you're recognized in debate. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And fortunately, I've had the benefit of um, speaking my mind and laying out my position uh, in reference to my substitute amendment. And I want to follow up on that. First of all, I've been very much handicapped in, in opposing this bill because of the incredible job and very articulate uh, job that this sponsor has done. Uh, he's obviously one of the most conservative members of this legislature. He's one of the most passionate and, um, and one of the most articulate. And, and uh, I respect your passion for this issue, Representative Gates, although I disagree with you just as passionately on the issue. We've talked about tourism. Uh, you know, I could talk for hours about the image of Florida and how this will be affected. We have talked about the safety of our constituents. Uh, I don't think it will be a doomsday uh, scenario either, Representative uh, Rodriguez, although it certainly increases the potential that there will be um, some very significant safety issues for my constituents. What I'm really worried about is the officer safety implications, and that is the issue that goes undiscussed the most throughout this process. Uh, I'm fearful of the, of the impact that it will have on officers and deputy sheriffs having to be on patrol and respond to calls for service with an exponentially uh, increased amount of firearms in play. I'm concerned about the concept that has been put forth today that our, our constituents don't have the right to protect themselves with firearms as it, is, as it is today in our current law. It's just not true. We have the inherent right. You know, you guys, some people say it's God-given, uh, or some say it, it emanates from the Bible. I'm a state lawmaker, and we make state laws. We don't make biblical laws. Uh, and, and the reality is that these rights come from the Second Amendment and, and Article 1, Section 8. The real issue is and Speaker Hudson has talked about this, is an apparent conflict between the professions here. But the reality is that that's just not true. With all due respect to the three sheriffs, Sheriffs Ivy, Finch, and Smith, I, I don't know of any other sheriffs that have publicly stood up today, uh, elected sheriffs that have stood up today and endorsed this policy. But they are three of 67, and we have had over 80% of those sheriffs voting uh, 67. Sheriffs. Only one is not, uh, one or two, only one is not elected. Um, so an overwhelming majority of elected sheriffs have said we don't want this policy. Now let's turn our attention briefly to the Chiefs of Police Association. I want to read a letter uh, that I received or uncovered in public records request. And this is from a, a very large police department. And th this is right after the Chiefs of Police Association voted to endorse this bill, although as I sit here today, it's still unclear to me what their position is on open carry. I did receive your email correspondence on, on the morning of Monday, December 7th. Unfortunately, I was unable to respond to your request by 4 p.m. deadline as my day was taken up with previously scheduled obligations. The Florida Police Chiefs Association has unwitt unwittingly created more division within our statewide profession by publicly supporting this bill when the Florida Sheriff's Association opposes it. We need to unite as law enforcement community. The fact that our elected board negotiated changes without first seeking input from the membership and then asking for our comments within a seven hour window is counterproductive. I do not support this proposal and I'm not aware of any other police chief who does. As one of our colleagues noted during our standards meeting Wednesday, on Wednesday, the only information the public will see is that our police of chief supported open carry. Public safety and the safety of our police officers and deputies take precedence over finding palatable provisions any governing board could live with. Whether someone will carry their firearm in a holster or not will have little impact on the safety of our officers and the community and will do little, if anything, to quell the alarm that such open carrying creates. I strongly oppose this legislation that allows our residents to openly carry. I urge our board uh, to reconsider their current position by officially pulling our membership. I then followed up with the Chiefs of Police Association by text, and I said, can you please text me the names of the members of your board who voted regarding open carry? Respectfully, Reb Kerner. Hello, Reb Kerner. This is not information that we share externally. So the concept that th there is dissension within this profession is false. Three sheriffs are opposed uh, to my amendment and support open carry, uh, but the rest of the, the the profession is uniformly pretty much in, su in support of killing this bill. Now, sure, we support some of the amendments and the carrying provision or the holster provisions, but the reality is uh, uniformly law enforcement 
from leadership down to the street level officer is opposed to this. And any suggestion that that is not true is, is incorrect. Um, I'm almost done, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the indulgence. It's not our constituents that are going to have to deal with the repercussions of this bill. It's going to be the men and women in uniform. And that scares me. We don't know whether a felon, uh, a member of a gang standing on a street corner who's openly carrying is a felon or not. And, and police officers have to deal with that practical issue. We don't. In the middle of the night, in the middle of the day, on a traffic stop, those are the men and women that are going to have to deal with the repercussions of this bill. It's not something that I can support, regardless of any amendment that is attached to it. I'm very disappointed in, in some of the things that have, can, have occurred today with regards to the amendments, uh, particularly amendments that would have strengthened the rights and protections of our law enforcement officers. And if you're okay with that, and you support that policy, and we all talk about supporting police officers, and this is the time to step up and do it. I'm ashamed in the, in the way that Sheriff Gultieri has been treated throughout this process by the media, and, and by other stakeholders, and it's unfortunate. I apologize on behalf of, of myself, because that's the only person that I can speak on behalf of. But nobody wants this policy except a very small group of Floridians. And I don't think we should jeopardize the image and safety of our state and our law enforcement officers to appease uh, a theory of constitutional law that is not accurate. Thank you. Representative Gates. Oh. Representative Moskowitz, you're recognized in debate. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, I, uh, this, first of all, the, this, this issue could not have a, a better sponsor. Uh, Chair Gates has, has worked on uh, the Second Amendment and gun rights uh, since he's been uh, in the legislature. Uh, and and we, we all know that, you know, Marion Hammer is, is like a sovereign nation and has sovereign immunity. So, uh, <laughs> you know. She, she will continue to fight to, to the very last breath uh, on, on these issues. Um, but, but Speaker Hudson said something very important. He said common sense. And I'm going to vote against this bill not because of the open carry issues. I'm going to vote against this bill because of two things that are unaddressed. Well, a couple things, but two main things that are unaddressed. And I am totally surprised that the majority party doesn't look at these two issues more seriously and isn't weighing the balance of the Second Amendment versus common sense policies. The Second Amendment isn't absolute. If it were absolute, there'd be no background checks, there'd be no waiting periods. So it isn't absolute. So we have common sense policies. But, but I am shocked that we would say, you can't board a spirit flight and sit in the middle row and go to a tiny bathroom from Miami to New Jersey. You can't do that. But for those people who are on the no-fly list who can't get on that flight, you can go get a gun, you can go get a concealed weapons permit, and you can openly carry. I'm shocked. I, I can't believe that we're not addressing that issue. And go, guess what? Guess who else couldn't address that issue? Washington, D.C. They wouldn't even bring that issue up for a vote. I'm bringing that amendment to the floor because that is public safety. I understand the list isn't perfect, but since when is trying to prevent terrorism about being perfect? Okay, we have to do everything we can, and that's why that list was created. Let me give you another glaring issue. A concealed weapons permit and openly carry is not a right for non-US citizens. With all of the arguments coming out of the majority party now about people coming into this country, you know, getting visas and wanting to do this and the laws about strengthening that process, I am also shocked that under this law, under the way it's drafted, the San Bernardino shooter, both of them, could have applied for a concealed weapons permit and could have openly carried. This should only be for US citizens. And I can't believe, after all the stuff that we see, and the words, and the leadership on the majority party on that issue, that it's a glaring omission in this bill. 
don't even know how you can support it without fixing those issues. Now listen, I applaud Chairman Gates on trying to fix the issue on dealing with police officers. Because think about this scenario. If a police officer had asked the San Bernardino shooter to see their license and they didn't have probable cause, that police officer could be sued for $5,000 individually under the way this is written. And this is not a red herring. I'm not creating some sort of crazy argument. I'm trying to close loopholes in this bill. Uh, you know, I, I agree that this is not going to be the apocalypse. But for some people who want to know why us in the minority party continue to disapprove of these things is because we continue to see the march dealing with guns to allow more of them and more of them and more of them. And we know that there are issues, not with law-abiding citizens. This is not about law-abiding citizens. We know there's issues with gun violence. We know there's issues with the illegal proliferation of guns. We know there's issues in the African American community with gun violence. You know what this legislature has done on all three of those issues? Nothing. Zero. The body camera bill, we won't fund it. We've done nothing. So the frustration on our part is, we know you recognize that there's issues on the other side that have nothing to do with the Second Amendment, that have nothing to do with protecting the Constitution. But we've done nothing on those issues. And yet the march on the other side continues. And so uh, I, I look forward to working with Representative Gates to, to fix uh, the issue uh, dealing with police officers uh, so that they're not going to be individually sued if someone doesn't present uh, their license. Uh, I look forward to working with Representative Gates uh, so that someone who is a lawful citizen who has a concealed weapons permit doesn't have to figure out whether they've walked into a private hospital or a public hospital because there's no way they're going to know. Um, and I know, I know the sponsor is going to work on these things, but I implore you guys, I implore you, that if you want to move forward with this, you make sure that someone who can't get on a plane can't get a concealed weapons permit. I implore you, if someone is here and they're not a US citizen, in the climate we're living in, you don't allow them to get a concealed weapons permit. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I can't vote for this bill. OK, Representative Gates, you're recognized to close on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There comes a point where everything has been said, but not yet by everybody. Uh, and I think we passed that point long ago. So, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of brevity, I would simply ask that the members of the committee support the Second amend Amendment, vindicate the rights of our citizens, and move this bill to the floor. Uh, thank you, Representative. Representative Gates, having closed, Michelle, please call the roll. Chairman McBurney. Yes. Representatives Burton. Yes. Dudley. No. Edwards. Fant. Yes. Gonzalez. Yes. Carroll? Hudson? Yes. Kerner? No. Metz? Yes. Moskowitz? No. Pasadomo? Yes. Flaken? Yes. Raywinkle Vasilinda? Yes. Rodriguez? No. Stone? Yes. Trujillo? Yes. Wood? Yes. Chairman, the bill passes. And by your vote, the committee substitute committee substitute House Bill 163 will be reported favorable. Thank you, Representative. All right, next we have. Thank you for your patience. Let's wait just a 